do not listen to the church. Should the church speak up more? But she has been speaking a lot about those issues. And I could say all have been said already on justice. So the problem may be how Christians receive the words of the church on those matters of, of justice. There is clearly some resistance, some apathy, some ignorance. Many people just don't like these questions, which would destabilize them or which would seem critical of their action. So the charism of Father Arupe has inspired and guided the society in a new understanding of its missions. It becomes necessary to enter into a real struggle in order to transform structures which have generated so much oppression and injustice. So many Jesuits and their friends are active in works of analysis and transformation of the society, as we will see later. Under in this invitation, they really become men and women for others. Now I come to Pope Francis. It's amazing how this Pope has been telling so many things in a little over 100 days, with modest, very modest and simple, simple gesture. He has practiced simplicity. He wants simple liturgy. He rides an ordinary car. He goes around in a car, which is a problem with the security people. He has kept his old shoes, and with other people, he lives in the same residence in Santa Marta and not in his own apartments. So all simplicity. But what is, what is more striking it, what he, he, is what he repeats all the time. He says that the papacy, quote, must open its, arm, its, its arms to all the people of God and embrace with affection and tenderness all of humanity, in particularly the poorest, the weakest, the smallest, whoever is hungry, thirsty, whoever is foreign, naked, sick, and in prison. And he did it. He went in prison to wash the feet of prisoners. He speaks about migrants. He went to Lampedusa, this place where thousands of migrants arrived from Africa to Europe. He wanted to pay attention and to pay his respect to those immigrants with very strong words against the indifference of Europe. And the Pope speaks himself very often of justice and politics. He said to the students of Jesuit schools on June 7th, last June, quote, we cannot play as Pontius Pilate and wash our hands. We must get involved in politics because politics is one of the highest form of charity. And he adds, I quote, politics is too often corrupt because Christians are not involved in politics in an evangelical spirit. And in a famous, famous speech to the diplomat, diplomatic corps on May 16, Francis has had very strong words against the excess of liberalism. I quote, free market capitalism has created the tyranny of money and on injustice. While the income of a minority is increasing exponentially, that of the majority is crumbling. That was a strong stand for an assembly of very sophisticated people like all the ambassadors. All this is new for him. Excuse me, all this is not new for him. What Jorge Maria Bergoglio was saying to his city in Buenos Aires is very strong. And I read several of his speeches to the people of the city. For instance, against child trafficking. In the city of Buenos Aires, he said, child, child prostitution is offered in five stars hotels. It is included in the entertainment menu under the heading other. And in his cathedral, he was saying a mass of thanksgiving 
every year on the national day, March 25th in Argentina. It became his sort of State of the Union address. And he was so strong on injustice that the president of Argentina, Mr. Kirchner, refused to go there anymore. Should have even been more prudent, but he's not like that. He just says simply what he thinks. Pope Francis is shaking the church in a new way that we have not seen earlier. And it all goes in the direction of a church serving the poor. Many Christians recognize themselves in this new way of understanding the role of the Pope. And there have never been so many people at the general audiences or the angelus of the Pope in Rome. It's like it's Easter almost every Sunday. Now I conclude with some reflection on social doctrine and Ignatian spirituality. So the question remains, how come things are not changing really in some Christian countries? What happened to the practice of Christians? Peter Hans Kolvenbach, who was the general just after Father Arupe, had this terrible sentence, which he said in the year 2000 in a conference given at Santa Clara in California. He said this, how come our school of medicine in Beirut, he was there before, how come our school of medicine in Beirut, which was managed by very holy Jesuits, will produce some of the most corrupt citizens of the city? How is that possible? What the social doctrine of the church has to say on justice is more relevant than ever here and in many other places, with the particularity that here the great majority of people is Catholic. And every country has to find a way to apply that. This insistence on justice does not make a political program or a strategy to improve things, but it wants at least to create the beginning of a movement among Christians who will have to find the best ways to answer to those questions of injustice. Two means seems to me important. The first is to maintain alive the spirit of Father Arupe, the spirit of Pope Francis, inspiration, service of others, men and women for others, more justice, fruit of our faith. Both of them, Father Rupe, Pope Francis, roots their spirit in meditation of the gospel and a great love of God. The other means, the other ways is to make state laws to work for national building, as we say, nation building. This will apply this inspiration. You need a public authority which is willing to defend the common good. And then laws will be applied without exception. The change of art is not enough. You need law and you need a state for the common good of all. This is in some way very Ignatian. Love is proved when it is put into acts more than in two worlds. Law, institution, one organization will allow the spirit of love to be incarnated. Without that incarnation, love is just a nice word. Saint Ignatian, Saint Ignatius, and this will, and this will be my conclusion, Saint Ignatian was very realistic. The authenticity of Christian experience is ultimately verified in love and service of the neighbor. And following Ignatius, Father Arupe gives us three practical means to get this principle of justice through love down to reality, the reality of everyday life. You can read that on internet on men for others. Twice, so then you have to do it. 
This is live more simply, and the Pope is giving the example, live more simply. Second, no unjust profit. This is a personal behavior for all Christians. And the third, change unjust structures. And at least do not fight against the measures which would lead to more justice. All this demands a real personal transformation so we can pray that the Spirit gives this great desire to each of us. Maramin Salamat Po. Thank you, Father Pierre. Mercy. Maramin Salamat. The next presentation will be given by Father Robert Rivera. He will speak about the social mission as, uh, as explained and presented by Father Pierre, but this time in the context of current challenges in the Philippine province Jesuits, ministries and apostolates, which include the Ministry of Education, where Ateneo de Manila is part of. Father Robert Rivera spent his grade school, high school, and college in the Ateneo de Manila University. He graduated in 1988 Bachelor of Science in Legal Management, and obtained his Master's in Sociology and Theology also in the Ateneo. In 2008, Father Robert got his doctorate degree in Sociology. So he is one of uh, what Father Pierre says, Jesuit sociologists. Um, he got it from the University of Notre Dame in the United States, specializing in the Sociology of Religion. He has taught sociology at the Ateneo since 2009. Father Robert has also been part of the core staff of the John Carroll Institute on Church and Social Issues. Father Jack Carroll is here with us. Uh, ICSI, JJC ICSI, it's now called, as research associate and treasurer since 1995. He has also worked as formator of seminarians and Jesuit scholastics. He is currently the province assistant. He's a province officer of the Philippine uh, Jesuits for the social apostolate in the Jesuit Philippine province, coordinating all our social apostolate institutions and prog programs in the province all over the country. Friends, please welcome Father Robert Rivera. Thank you very much, Carol. I'm, I'm using PowerPoint so the camera won't be focused on my face. So that will make it a more pleasant experience for me and especially for you. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much, Father Pierre, for the very uh, incisive and comprehensive uh, remarks. Father Pierre and I both stay at the Loyola House of Studies. And uh, when Father Pierre first arrived at Loyola House uh, several months ago, I was telling him, or recounting to him, that uh, uh, many years ago when I was still a college student and when Father Pierre first taught here at the Ateneo in the late 80s, I was actually required to attend one of his talks by, uh, I, I, if I recall correctly, it was a class uh, of uh, Dr. Jim Caraos, who is here, I think, or was here earlier. No? Uh, so I was telling Father Pierre, you know, Father Pierre, uh, you, you, I remember you gave a very good talk, except that I did not understand a single word that you said. No? He was speaking about Marxism <laughs> and uh, social change and the like. No? Uh, and Father Pierre said something like, oh, that, that's understandable. You were young and stupid then. No? So, <laughs> uh, so Father Pierre, I trust, no, even though I did not understand your talk, it planted seeds no, that I was not aware of, which allowed me to become a Jesuit like you and also to work in the field of social science. No? So uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, this morning, and I'm especially humbled to speak you know, right after Father Pierre. Uh, dear friends, my task this morning is to provide an overview of the Jesuit social mission in the context of contemporary issues and challenges. Uh, Father Charantene has, in a sense, given us the broad historical vistas of uh, Catholic social teaching, the pronouncements of the church, the society of Jesus, 
and the Jesuit social mission. For this talk, I sh tr shall try to situate these teachings and mission vis-a-vis uh, -vis the contemporary challenges and context of Philippine society. It will be an attempt, in other words, to provide a fleeting overview of what has been done and what needs to be done to respond to the exigencies, to the challenges of Catholic social teaching, of the church's teaching, of the society's challenges. No? To fulfill, in other words, the mandate of the Jesuit social mission in the Philippines. Uh, allow me to utilize two parallel frameworks for this discussion. One is drawn, because the talk is supposed to be uh, uh, at least partly, you know, an introduction to uh, the social apostolate and Indonesian spirituality. One of these frameworks draws from the basic dynamic of the spiritual exercises, which many of you know is the guide, the manual, if you like, for prayer and discernment drawn up by St. Ignatius of Loyola during his own journey of conversion and calling. The other, and I'm very glad Father Charantine gave us a good introduction to this, is of course the seminal insights of Father Pedro Arupes 1973 address, Men for Others, given in Valencia, Spain before the 10th International Jesuit, Con Jesuit Alumni Congress of Europe. Interestingly, you know, if you follow, and I hope you follow Father Sher uh, Pierre Charantane's suggestion, if you look it up in the internet, you will immediately be, if you Google Men for Others, you will be drawn to the document on the Creighton, University of Creighton website. And they explain there that they have re- uh, uh, they have modified the document a bit. No? The document was originally men for others, but it's now called men and women for others no? to make it more uh, gender sensitive for our times today. No? Using these frameworks, I shall try to show how the Jesuit social mission is above all a response to the divine call for us to truly love God and country, a call emanating from the heart of Christ himself. The exposition will be given in three parts, which I summarize in terms of memory, reality, and possibility. I'll explain this later. I beg your indulgence also as I draw quite freely from my own experience, somewhat limited, of growing up here at the Ateneo and of working in the Jesuit social apostolate of the Philippine province of the Society of Jesus. Let us go to the first then, memory. If you look at the spiritual exercises, or better, you know, if you undergo the retreat you know, that St. Ignatius you know, recommends for us all, the first week of the spiritual exercises begins with the remembrance of God's gifts and graces, of all good things that have come from above. St. Ignatius asks the retreatant to consider all the many blessings that we have received from the most basic ones, you know, our creaturehood, our being sons and daughters of God, and then this goodness is set against our own sinfulness and ingratitude. So much so that St. Ignatius would tell his retreatants, he would invite them to be drawn to tears while considering God's fidelity to forgetful and sinful, ungrateful humanity. And similarly, I think there are parallels here to Father Pedro Arupe's words in Men for Others. Father Pedro Arupe similarly appeals to our memory. He says, and I quote here, Recall the Old Testament, that first alliance, the pact of Yahweh with his chosen people. It was basically concerned with, with the carrying out of justice to such a degree that the violation of justice as it concerns people implies a rupture of the alliance with God. Turn now, recall, again, the memory to the New Testament and see how Jesus has received from his father the mission to bring the good news to the poor, liberation to the oppressed, and to make justice triumph. Blessed are the poor. Why? Because the kingdom has already come. The liberator is at hand. Uh, this then, I believe, represents the important basis for Ignatian social action, the important and essential starting point. It begins when the hearts of men and women are inflamed, when they remember with a, and are given a profound sense of God's love, ignited by the memory of His blessings and graces. And in a sense too, this is the primary task to be accomplished by Jesuit education, for it to become what Pedro Arupe calls education 
for justice. It is to provide mentors and exemplars leading lives touched by God's love, lives which are then shared with the people beloved by God himself. Many of us are familiar with that hallmark of Jesuit education, cura personalis. And I believe these words from Ignatius and Pedro Arupe remind us that cura personalis, the care of persons, reaches its apex when it produces people who learn in turn to care for others. In other words, men and women for others. Sorry. Uh, all of us here who have gone through Jesuit education can surely point to individuals, both Jesuit and lay, who have served as exemplars of service and generosity. They have guided and challenged us from our earlier years to be, in other words, persons caring for others. Our generation of Athenians, for instance, I first entered the grade school in 1972, uh, and shortly after, martial law was declared. So we, we were literally martial law babies, no, as they called them. No? Our generation of Athenians, for instance, looked up to the likes of Father John Pollock, no? the indefatigable grade school chaplain who spent long hours, no, became very famous for spending long hours in the confessional and was the model for us of true sanctity. Father Pollock never spoke to us about the hardships he experienced as a prisoner in Fort Santiago, I believe, during the Second World War, or his many long years of, many, of, of missionary work in Mindanao. And yet, the stories reached us, nevertheless, making him even more inspiring. I remember Brother Jesus Oscaris, no, whom many of us remember as the crusty, uh, somewhat gruff, bass Jesuit who would curse students on the football field. He would say, si pa malakas, no, and other profanities that I cannot mention now. No. Uh, he was also famous for teaching generations of Athenians that song, which uh, many of you probably know, Fundador. No? Do they still teach that in the grade school at the Ateneo? No? So he taught us that song, Fundador. But I remember him very vividly, also speaking with great concern no, for the beggar children who had made their way up from Marikina Valley and asked for alms no, behind the cyclone fence surrounding the grade school cafeteria. I'm not sure if they're still able to do that now. No? Our class moderators, no, many of them lay people, no, especially in the latter years of grade school. Top-notch educators such as Mr. Nestor Santiago, Mrs. Luisa Belmonte, Mr. Delphine Bautista, all of them retired now from the Ateneo, were all models of total availability and dedication to their students. So there, no, even from the earliest years, we have all these mentors and exemplars inspiring us teaching us even our, in our fledgling years about what it means to be truly man for others. High school brought even more mentors and exemplars who helped nurture the growing sense of service and commitment. No? Uh, Father Jess Lucas, no, after whom uh, the Jess Lucas infirmary is now named, no, he succumbed to cancer at the very young age of 43, led us as moderator of the Ateneo Catechetical Instruction League and led us in teaching public school children catechism. Young teachers fresh from college. You know, uh, the, one of the more, more influential for me was Mr. Leonardo June Balmaceda, Mr. Balma as we would call him, helped us, helped us make sense of the turmoil the country was descending into after the assassination of Senator uh, Ninoy Aquino. Father Prudencio Macayan, the feared math teacher, uh, one of the strictest teachers I have ever known, and the first Jesuit I have heard to take the God's name in vain on a daily basis, no? was uh, an ardent defender, no? not just of the theories and axioms of algebra and geometry, but also of trees and plants, decades before the environmental movement was in vogue. No? So woe to the high school student who would pluck leaves from the trees. No? And, once in a while, you would catch Father Makayan scolding the young sapling. Why don't you grow up? No? Why aren't you growing up? No? And perhaps most influential of all, no? uh, and he was mentioned earlier by our president, no? uh, there was Father Jim O'Brien, Father Obi, our class moderator in fourth year high school. 
He introduced us to Tulong Dunong and the experience of taking responsibility as a kuya for a group of public school kids whom we would tutor and ensure that they somehow uh, change their lives for the better. No? Indulge me a bit as I, I go on. No? Uh, in college, this brought more uh, mentors no? and exemplars of generosity. Uh, for our generation of Athenians, no? at the center of our college experience, of course, was the EDSA revolution. And in the heady days before people power, I remember the late Father Roli Bonoan, no? Father Raul Bonoan, the dean of what was then the College of Arts and Sciences, joining the students in the clamor uh, to walk out of their classes and to troop to rallies in the Makati Business District. No? I remember one experience no, when my good friend Wawel Mercado and I, Wawel just passed away last year, were uh, shouting, walk out, walk out, no? and joining the other students. And then we came face to face with Father Roli with a very stern face. No? And since he was our moderator in high school, we were trying to hide ourselves. No? But then suddenly he asked us, I hope you two are going to the rally. No? And then he started chanting, walk out, walk out. No? Uh, so very influential. No? Jesuit priests and scholastics were, of course, at the forefront of the demonstrations during the four-day revolution itself. No? Many young teachers, again, no? some of them still teaching here, no? people like uh, Dr. Henry Totanes, Dr. James Simpas, who were helping us in the ACIL, helped us make sense of what was happening to the country and what our proper response should be. Uh, and slowly, there were also exemplars and mentors among our own peers and confers. One of my close friends in the ACIL, Alfonso Chito Shoson, uh, inspired by, again, no, by these very inspiring days, joined the Jesuit volunteers after graduating in 1987. He was assigned to teach in Asamta Tech School in Pampanga. And one stormy night, Chito went home to the farming family he was living with, no, drenched in wet and shivering from the cold, and succumbed to pneumonia the following morning. No, his death had a profound influence to all of us who knew him. I think we can go on and on. And all of us, different generations of Athenians gathered here, We'll have stories to tell and models to recall. But all of these lead us to the important reality that service begets service. Commitment begets commitment. Jesuit social action begins with education for justice, which continues to be the mission of the Ateneo today. It does not end there, however, and which brings us to the second part of my remarks. Uh, reality. After recalling and reliving the mystery of God's love, uh, St. Ignatius then invites the retreatants, the ones undergoing the spiritual exercises, to consider how the reality of God's love compels the Trinity in that famous contemplation on the Incarnation no? to send God himself, the Son, into the reality of the world where he will suffer for sinful humanity. He will serve and suffer for sinful humanity. This is the dynamic of what we call the second and then the third weeks of the spiritual exercises. And once again, I think there are parallels in uh, Pedro Arupe's uh, Men and Women for Others. He says here, just as the love of God in the Christian view fuses with love of neighbor to the point that they cannot possibly be separated, so too, charity and justice meet together and in practice are identical. How can you love someone and treat him or her unjustly? Take justice away from love and you destroy love. You do not have love if the beloved is not seen as a person whose dignity must be respected with all that, impl that, that implies. Just as we are never sure that we love God unless we love others, so we are never sure that we have love at all unless our love issues in works of justice. And in, an education for justice, in other words, inspires people to perform works of justice. It does not simply inflame them with love. For it to be complete, there has to be an outward movement. In what, again, continuing with Father Arupe, in what Father Arupe calls works of justice. No, and Father Pierre has mentioned this earlier, and I'm glad he did. No? 
here, he's, what does he call works of justice? He says, first, it's a basic attitude of respect for all people, no matter what their background, ethnicity, socioeconomic, gender, etc. is. Never uh, to have respect for them and never to use them as instruments for our own profit. Second, a firm resolve never to profit from or allow ourselves to be suborned by positions of power deriving from privilege. For to do so even passively is equivalent to active oppression. I'm sure many of us were moved by Father Jet's remarks earlier about how our president constantly asks, no? what can we do for the poor? How will this affect them? I think this directly addresses that. Third, an attitude not simply of refusal, but of counterattack, very strong words, against injustice, a decision to work with others toward the dismantling of unjust social structures so that the weak, the oppressed, the marginalized may be set free. So all these are the challenges for us of Jesuit education.